All right, let's try to pick apart what happened in North Korea. The Dan York State of Mind program is brought to you at part by Lookout Rhode Island and Taco Comfort Solutions. Or I should say in Vietnam, as it pertains to North Korea, welcome in to the Friday show. Thanks so much for tuning in. You know, on Friday's show, we kind of spread out the issues, whether we're kind of goofing off or trying to figure out something important. Um, we tape the Friday shows on Thursday, so in case something blows big here on Friday, we'll catch up on Monday on that. We also plan on Monday to take a look at what's happening in Warwick with its finances because reportedly they're kind of in a deep hole. In the meantime, uh, North Korea is something that we didn't get to last night with my guest Timothy Edgar as we talked mostly about the Michael Cohen hearing. I do at the end of our program tonight want to uh, bring up something that happened at the Michael Cohen hearing that I thought was just, I mean, retro and dumb. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll see if we can sneak that in. But the North Korean situation is, is pretty deep. Headline from uh, two nights ago for you, Trump, Kim, summit, uh, no agreement. Some headlines use the words collapsed. And so I'm sure the president didn't want to hear that. Uh, collapse generally comes with the word failure. I'm not necessarily sure that the collapse wasn't a good thing. I haven't picked Tim's brain on this. We do everything extemporaneously here, but I'll be interested to see what he thinks about that. In the meantime, earlier this week, Professor Mark Janess from the Naval War College, who speaks for himself on these matters, uh, was here as we previewed the North Korean summit, and he was, he was concerned about something that might happen with the president. I am afraid, as an incentive, that Trump will, accept, will say, okay, we can have a formal ending of the Korean War, which is something the North Koreans really want, mm. in exchange for promises only. And the North has done that repeatedly in the past. You have to have firm commitments that are verifiable um, and that you can uh, enforce. Yes. Um, doesn't look like that happened. Right. So I think that I agree with that 100 percent. And so I think that the substantive outcome is a good one, that we did not make uh, concessions to the North Koreans that were unwise. Uh, they wanted um, some significant you know, carrots that we had in our back pocket, lifting of sanctions, ending the Korean War, those kinds of things. Um, and I think there were a lot of people who were worried that Trump might just give these carrots away um, in order to uh, you know, get some praise, uh, maybe get the Nobel Peace Prize, um, and, and not get the kind of verifiable, you know, commitments to, not just commitments, but reality of dismantling uh, North Korea's nuclear weapons program. Uh, Timothy Edgar is a professor at Brown, has worked for both uh, sides of the aisle in Washington. He's a cybersecurity expert. His book is Beyond Snowden. We'll make sure there's a link on our website at foxprovidence.com so that you can see uh, and, and grab the book. It's been uh, out for, what, a year now or so? That's right. And, and it's and doing well. It's and doing very well and uh, won the Roy C. Palmer Civil Liberties Prize for from the Chicago Kent Law School, so I'm which, which is uh, very cool. You're really. I was uh, very gratified to hear. Well, and for those of you who are always thinking that Big Brother and government's creeping on you, this is a very informative, uh, nonpartisan, right down the line expertise explanation in layman's terms of all the stuff we have to worry about, from our phones to our watches to. Uh, right. I know he's got the watch from last night. That's it went right. Off. Uh, a lot of, lot of things we got to be concerned about yeah, out there. Yeah, that's right. It's, it's complicated. I tried to make it as easy to understand as possible without dumbing it down. Yeah. So the book is called Beyond Snowden. Make sure that you pick it up. In the meantime, uh, you listed a couple of things that everybody who was worried was worried about with this summit. I think there were a lot of folks who were concerned that the president may want to steal the headlines away from the Michael Cohen hearings. We had talked yesterday uh, about the timing. I thought the Democrats misplay. The Republicans just played poorly all the way through that hearing. We may get to that later in the broadcast. But I thought the Democrats should have waited a few days and, and let, the, let the story evolve in Vietnam with Kim Jong-un. So we had kind of a split focus. Do you agree? Um, 
I think up to a point. I mean, they do have to do their oversight. If you look at uh, Richard Nixon, his defenders sometimes would say, let's not wallow in Watergate because the president has too much important stuff to do with Vietnam. Mm -hmm. um, and that was an excuse. You know, obviously the Congress has to take its constitutional responsibilities. If you can delay it a few days and there's no harm, then sure. I think it's always better when you're performing <coughs> a constitutional function like that to do it very seriously and to make it clear to the public you're doing it for the right reasons and not for political reasons. Ironically, uh, guess where they were this week? That's Vietnam, right. Vietnam, right? right? In Hanoi, which is doing very well. And I'm sure Kim Jong-un took notice that it was doing very well that's, economically. That's absolutely right. And I think, you know, that's part of why <coughs> we have a lot to offer to North Korea, which is essentially they would like to break out of their isolation. The problem is they also want to keep their iron grip on power. And, and, and the regime there thinks that nuclear weapons are the linchpin to keeping their iron grip, that that keeps them safe, that nobody's going to mess with them if they have nuclear weapons, and so they don't want to give them up. Uh, but we, we can't you know, offer some kind of big deal like that if they don't, because that's what we need for uh, for our security interests. So the the format of this get together was was interesting. A couple of you know social visits along with uh, what reportedly was a one on one again with Kim Jong Un, uh, but I guess this time it was backed up, mm -hmm. and and the president didn't come out and report out on his lengthy one-on-one, -on -one, a la what he did with Putin, Putin in Helsinki, he seems to think that because Kim Jong-un is such a titular head that he didn't want to waste time with preliminary negotiations. Some wise people say, yeah, but you play that game and it doesn't go well, you got nowhere left to go. I think that's where the failure was. In other words, I'm glad we're not in a bad deal with North Korea. That's, that's much better than if we were in a bad deal with North Korea. But this summit should never have taken place. I mean, they, they were, the adequate groundwork was not laid. It seems to me that he was just looking for headlines and looking for, you know, something to, uh, to, 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 to show us. Um, you know, it struck me when we were talking about Michael Cohen, uh, the Nixon parallels. You know, Nixon ended up being forced to resign from office. Uh, his Secretary of State got the Nobel Peace Prize. I don't think Trump's going to get either. I think he's going to stay in office because the Republicans aren't going to get rid of him. I don't think he's going to get this kind of deal with North Korea. And the reason is he doesn't have a Kissinger. He doesn't have a careful strategist who's figuring all this out and laying the groundwork. And then he comes in at the end for the summit. He just wants that, that picture, but he doesn't want the work. He doesn't want the, the hard work that goes in to making a deal like that work. Um, and, and it goes to show, you know, the, the, kind of the, the kind of work that went into the Iran deal, frankly, but, that, that but, he just tore up. But maybe, maybe Mike Pompeo is good enough with the, with the unique, irrepressible, self-focused, narcissistic commander-in-chief that we have to do just enough to make sure this thing doesn't blow up or go the wrong way or we give the store away. So Kissinger, maybe not, but even Nixon didn't show some of the tendencies that Donald Trump Ab does. Absolutely not. I mean, no, no. Look, Donald Trump makes Nixon look good on a lot of levels. Um, the man was actually, for all of his flaws, I mean, I mean Nixon, a, a deep strategic thinker. And, and, you know, he legitimately deserves a lot of credit, not just uh, Kissinger. Uh, with, with Pompeo, you know, he seems to have succeeded in preventing a disaster. But in terms of actually achieving something, uh, I, I think that seems very elusive. Yeah, but here's the thing. Uh, well, you know what, we'll talk about it when we come back. We have to pause here. Uh, there are different measurements for success. Uh, this Secretary of State may be really key to keeping the finger in the proverbial you know, dike here because it could get worse. Stay with us. So just to refresh you, here was uh, yesterday's midday summary of what happened in Vietnam. President Trump says North Korea wanted too much to end its nuclear program, so he walked away. Basically, uh, they wanted the sanctions lifted in their entirety, and we couldn't do that. Kim Jong-un was willing to make some concessions, including totally dismantling the Yongbyon complex, North Korea's nuclear research and development center. Even the Yongbyon facility, uh, and all of its scope, which is important for sure, still leaves missiles 
uh, still leaves uh, warheads and weapon systems. Um, so there's a, there's, there's a lot of other elements that we just couldn't get to. The North Koreans were not willing to allow inspectors in to verify their steps to denuclearize. The leaders of South Korea and Japan say they spoke by phone with President Trump after the summit. Both say the president remains committed to following through on more talks in the future. General Vincent Brooks, a former commander of U.S. forces in Korea, tells CBS News that the process takes time. North Korea is a country that doesn't understand trust. It doesn't have trust in internally and it doesn't have trust experience externally mm -hmm. and so we shouldn't be surprised that they tripped here. And he pointed out that it has been 450 days since the North Koreans last tested a nuclear missile. I'm trying to figure out what the success equation is uh, for, for Donald Trump in this particular case. So watching that uh, only reinforces this concept that you and I have been talking about and that uh, Mark Janest and I talked about earlier in the week which is that this whole thing is so cart before the horse that all of this stuff that North Korea would or would not do certainly should have been crystal clear before Donald Trump went over there. Right. Uh, when you give a foreign leader uh, the platform of sitting down in a high profile with the President of the United States, you're giving that foreign leader something that they really, really want. So you don't want to give that away until you've laid the groundwork uh, for some kind of progress. We need to get something out of that. I think that was my big concern with this summit and, and with the whole relationship actually between uh, Trump and Kim Jong-un. It, it's, it's, you know, frankly uh, astonishing the kinds of, you know, things that Trump says about, you know, him and other authoritarian leaders. Wow. And um, it gives him so much of what he already wants uh, without having to give us anything at all. Well, he's, it's, so, it's amazing. He's so transactional and thinking that it's all about just a, you know, bull session. Right. That, that he, can, he can do it in, in, in that scope. He seems to have no uh, respect or understanding because he's such a disruptor of what it takes to bring these things home and how cool it is for North Korea's leader to meet with him. He right. dumbs down the country's earned dominance. That's right. That's right. I mean, did we see, you know, uh, Obama flying around giving huge photo ops to the Iranian leaders during the negotiation over the Iranian deal? No, because they knew that that would be something that they would value. So instead, you had painstaking negotiation over a long period of time and real, you know, test of, of verifiable uh, disarmament before you would start to, uh, you know, to, to, to make the deal work. Um, and, and that's what you need. You can't, there's no short circuit, there's no shortcut uh, to these kinds of peace agreements. And I think that's part of the problem is that what uh, President Trump wanted is a shortcut. He wants, you know, the glossy headlines, he wants the big summit, he wants the handshake, he wants to sign something. Um, thank God he was able to be persuaded, well, this isn't going to happen uh, because they're, you know, we don't have a, a deal, and, and he called it off. Um, but, you know, really there was no reason to have done this in the first place. It's almost like you see Mike Pompeo in that, in that, in that story, and you see Donald Trump nodding next to him as if Donald Trump you know, again, I'm making some assumptions yeah. here, but just based on track record, as if Donald Trump had just kind of learned that stuff and, and was, was affirming that he had been sold on the concept literally in Vietnam. Like, hey, boss, you can't do this. Right, right. You don't can't, do this. Th they don't get to take away one nuclear plant we know about and keep a bunch of other weapon systems and not let inspectors in and all of that stuff. You know, that that's just not going to fly. And, and just to, don't get me wrong here. I think we should be talking to the North Koreans. I think that is an absolutely essential and vital effort. So I'm not saying that that shouldn't be done. I'm saying that the big team to summit team, meeting, though. team to, to team, team to team. You know, the the big. You know, we, we you know we don't bring out your you know your CEO, your president. You don't bring out the big boss for the big glossy thing until uh, you've made a lot more progress than this. Can you wind it back now? That's the that's the danger. That's the real danger. Is that by having the talks collapse in this way? that you've set yourself back, that you've increased tension, that you create the possibility of going backwards towards them doing nuclear tests, towards rhetoric. Uh, so that's why you don't raise the stakes like that. You do, you do you know, straightforward, step-by-step -step negotiations um, that, that keep things 
keep a lid on things and, and keep things going in the right direction. Well, the stakes are interesting because the president's view of the stakes and the, and the countries and your yeah. specific expertise and so many others like you, uh, their definition of the stakes seem to be very different. You know, the first meeting was about building the relationship and you know I'm a transactional guy and I can get this thing done and Barack Obama brought us to the brink of war and look at me I'm gonna I'm gonna schmooze this guy and he's a good guy and blah blah blah, blah. okay well you give him that one but this one failing uh, to bring some kind of discipline from North Korea and some verification what then in this team to team concept that you know yeah. I've been talking yeah. about, what is the chance that it can now be delegated? Does he understand this time around you can't put your head in the guillotine? You can't be 11 feet out on a 10 foot board here. Right, right. Can we get back to team to team? Well, I hope so. I mean, international. Because that's where the conversations need to be. The, the big problem here is that international diplomacy is not a reality TV show. You know, we had our summit. Everything went well. Now we have another summit. Everything goes poorly. Now what's what's the next episode going to say? <laughs> you know, no. You want things to to be as boring as possible. You know, you want people to be you know having their eyes glazed over when they read about this kind of stuff in the paper. And, and I think that that's a concept that I don't think uh, President Trump gets. Uh, like you said, he's a disruptor. He, you know, he sometimes you know those kinds of unpredictability things can work, but they're they're risky. And you don't do them for no purpose. And he can't walk away without rubbing Kim Jong-un's belly. Here's a headline on this young man's death that the Otto you know, Warmbier's story, uh, this, is, this is maybe a lower level, all due respect to the life of Otto, but I'll take him at his word. It's very replicate of the Putin versus his own intel agencies. Yeah. Uh, the Yashogi journalistic situation, you know, loss of life in Turkey and the Saudi Arabian embassy and, and, and the Saudi prince more or less saying, I ain't boss, not me. I mean, he, he, this, this propensity to just buy the bad actor's behavior is incredible. It's, it's disgraceful, and it destroys American moral leadership and credibility. It's one of the most important things the president has. Uh, this president has shredded it time and time again. This is just the latest example of it. Um, and, you, you know, what, what astonishes me, again, is the way in which people who know better uh, in his party uh, don't try to rein him in. Uh, they, they stick with him, uh, defend him, uh, you know, don't slap him down. If he doesn't get a consequence for these kinds of actions, just like anyone, uh, he, he's going to continue, and he has continued. Well, speaking of uh, embarrassing... Uh, I want to check back in on that Cohen hearing one more time. There was an episode there yeah. that uh, we need to talk about. Stay with us. I don't know if you caught this little episode during the Cohen hearings yesterday. Made some very um, demeaning comments about the, the president that Ms. Patton doesn't agree with. In fact, it has to do with your claim of racism. She says that as a daughter of a man born in Birmingham, Alabama, that there is no way that she would work for, a, uh, for a, an individual who was racist. And to indicate that I asked someone who is a personal friend of the, the Trump family, who has worked for him, who knows this particular individual, that she's coming in to be a prop, it's racist to suggest that I ask her to come in here for that reason. That was not my intention, and I do apologize if that's what it sounded like, but I said someone in general. Um, and as everybody knows in this chamber, I'm pretty direct, so I, if I wanted to say that, I would have, but that's not what I said. Well, let me tell you something. There's a bunch of things going on there. Uh, Representative Tlaib, who's quite the, quite yeah. the uh, um, well, she's an interesting character, no doubt. Uh, I, I, yesterday, I first criticized her for... For, for making a run at this uh, without being able to finish it off, and I still feel that way. She made a good point, yeah. and then she backed off of it under duress, which I, you know, folks can judge that for what it's worth. But the Republicans just doing nothing but exclusively trying to make Michael Cohen liar, liar, pants on fire, okay, that was bad enough. But that move... Yeah. What, what, what did you think it, about that? It, it just, 
doesn't, it makes no c common sense. I mean, just, I, I thought back to all of the times that I've been with somebody who's made, you know, a racist comment to me. Um, and, and, you know, this is something that's true for most of us, I think, who are white. You know, if there's no, if there's no minority, there's no uh, African American or other person in the car with you, and they think, they can just say something nasty. Uh, and, and, and sometimes you call them out and maybe sometimes you don't, uh, you know. And, and so what Michael Cohen was saying is, I was in the car with Donald Trump and he said these things. I, I thought that was completely credible. You know, of, of course, I mean, you know, are we surprised by that? I, I don't think anyone would be. A, and then for Mark Meadows to come in and say, well, here's a, here's an African American woman who works for him and he's never said those things around her. Well, of course he didn't. I, I mean, you know, do we have stupid panted on our forehead? I mean, of course. That doesn't make any sense. And she actually, I, I, I made a mistake. We, we tape our Friday shows on Thursday. This happened on Wednesday. So on Thursday morning, um, she, was, she was continuing, uh, Lynn Patton, she was continuing to defend her yeah. actions. I mean, she, she doesn't want to admit that she was kind of hooked into something which is, so 1970s in terms of I know I happen to it, it, that the first time you hear somebody yeah. say I happen to know a black person or I happen to have one of my best friends is a black person. And he wasn't even saying that. He was saying that I have a, a black employee. I have an African American employee. Like this disproves that I have said some racist things in the past. I mean that just makes it just doesn't pass any kind of test or feel a certain way. And, and I think that he was doing something that was grandstanding. He was using her as a prop. He was the, the term that we use in the universities these days, he was called out. Right. And he lashed out as a result of being called out. And frankly, unfortunately, I, I, I really wish Representative Talib had not backed down in that way. Right. I right. think she was trying to be collegial, but I think she should have said, look, I'm calling you out on something that's not well, okay. Well, I think, I think she lost her, her gumption. I uh, think that's right. Uh, you know, but the, I have never, in all the hearings I've watched, maybe, I mean, you've been in Washington uh, yeah. working this stuff. I don't ever remember a human prop. People don't walk behind that thing. They may be called for a witness testimony. They may be in the audience and be recognized, but I've never seen somebody come by and say, hey, take a look at her. Uh, this is an example of what we're trying to prove. I, it, that was just it very just, it weird. It doesn't prove anything. It's demeaning. It makes no sense. And it was right to call him out on and, what and, he was and doing. And by the way, Congressman Meadows, at least three times I've seen in the last 24 hours clips of him talking about Barack Obama. I should go back to Kenya. So, you know. And he may have African-American staffers. He might. And it, that doesn't mean that, you know, it's okay. Hmm. Thank you for all your uh, expertise over the last two days. I appreciate it. We have a final word when we come back. All right, we're going to come back uh, to the local scene on Monday. The city of Warwick has reportedly a significant deficit, and I'm not so sure right now that leadership is up to the task, what with rumors of FBI investigations and the like. I'm not sure how significant that is or not, but maybe we can get some answers next week. Thanks so much for tuning in. You have a great weekend. We'll see you on the radio at 3 until 6 on Monday as well. Good night.